un messaggio universale per tutti gli uomini. You uh, said you were quite influenced by Keith Har uh, Haring. Uh, can you maybe comment on that or, or maybe mention some of your other influences? Um, you know, the, uh, around the time that I started taking the subway with my, uh, probably around the time I was in the sixth grade, um, I would take the subway, maybe we had a meeting in Manhattan, my mom had some errands to run and she dragged me with her. And we would get to these stations and they were always Keith Haring chalk drawings on the uh, empty ad spaces. And, you know, they were so uh, common that I thought that someone was paid to put those up the same way they were putting up the advertising. And then when my mom told me that someone was doing that illegally, um, there was this kind of fascination behind the idea that someone could be everywhere I went before I got there. And uh, I became fascinated with that concept and idea. And around the same time, I discovered graffiti, so it just made complete sense that, you know, these guys were going places and leaving their names on subways and buses and landmark locations throughout the city. And uh, I was fascinated by that. You know, you never really saw the act of graffiti being committed. It was just there when you arrived. And it was uh, something about the mystique of it all that really uh, spoke to me. And then, uh, of course, watching Subway Graffiti uh, pass by. It was typically a character that accompanied the graffiti piece. It was typically something borrowed from popular culture. So maybe I saw The Thing from the Fantastic Four, or Mickey Mouse uh, from Fantasia, or uh, Vaughn Bodie's Cheech Wizard, or his various lizards or Bodie Broads. But they were always these characters that I was familiar with. So, you know, between the two of that, really just, you know, made for uh, interesting times in my life. You know, my focus suddenly shifted from some of my other interests and I was just completely fascinated with graffiti. So, if you want to, can you maybe uh, talk about the, the film that you've been involved with uh, recently? Sure. Um, my good friend Charlie Ahern, uh, who's the director of the seminal hip hop film Wild Style, recently shot a documentary, or recently completed his documentary, uh, Jamal Shabazz, Street Photographer. Um, Jamel was a, uh, is a street photographer from Red Hook, Brooklyn. I grew up in the uh, Fort Greene, Clinton Hill section of Brooklyn. Um, we shared a very similar uh, path during the 80s. Jamel's a little bit older than me, but um, Jamel successfully documented um, many of the very interesting people that lived in New York City, um, primarily Brooklyn, Bed-Stuy, Red Hook. Uh, maybe Clinton Hill, Fort Greene, a few other uh, surrounding communities. But I think what's so fascinating and what's also so unique about Jamel's photos is that uh, Jamel was able to document some very unapproachable people during a very dangerous time in New York City. And, uh, you know, there really aren't any photo collections that I'm aware of in New York City um, quite like Jamel's. So, um, I'm very familiar with the content, some of the uh, geographical locations, and many of the people that appear in Jamel's books. So Charlie invited me to uh, do an interview for the film. So I've been in the I'm in the film, I might have, uh, maybe have about a five, ten minute interview in here, I'm not quite sure. But um, I'm in the film, uh, the film recently made its uh, theatrical debut at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. So I was on a uh, panel recently with uh, Charlie Ahern, Bobito, Sharp, and, uh, and myself. Um, and I also designed the movie poster for the film. So the film is currently making its uh, theatrical debut throughout the United States and touring. So, uh, yeah, so keep your eyes peeled for that film. Cool. And the, the title of it? It's called Jamel Shabazz, Street Photographer. Perfect. Uh, what, what would you say are some big projects that you have coming up, or what are, what, what's coming up in the next year for you? Um, there are definitely some more print projects on deck. Um, at the moment, I'm working on a really big initiative with Red Bull. Uh, which is called the Rite of Passage. Um, it's a celebration um, for a uh, book launch, um, a museum exhibit that's through the uh, Museum of New York City. And uh, it's a three-pronged celebration. And then um, lastly, uh, it's a launch party for our uh, initiative, which is called Rite of Passage. So it's um, four days worth of seminars and workshops uh, for aspiring artists, um, street art aficionados and graffiti fans. 
to enlarge your perception uh, of, on the culture in a host of different areas from people that have all excelled in these fields. So there's a graphic design class, there's a workshop on the business of graffiti, um, you know, uh, a uh, conversation with the Vandal Squad, um, and uh, a bunch of other very interesting, relevant um, artists that have uh, all contributed to the culture. So they're just going to be uh, doing workshops with uh, some invited participants, and this is going on in October. So it's a huge initiative. We're in the process of transforming two of the floors at the Red Bull space and kind of decorating it with all of this very interesting, culturally relevant and historical uh, art artifacts and documents and canvases and books. And so that's one of the projects. And then I'm working on a big project for a denim company in New York right now. And we're doing a celebration about 10 days after the Red Bull event. And uh, yeah, there's some other sneaky projects on deck, which I hope to share more as they start to materialize. So uh, it's it's interesting. It's, it's uh, you've had to expand, not just you know you started out as a writer. You didn't think it was gonna maybe amount to much other than going out and you know doing your thing, and but not turning into maybe your life um, thing that you make a living at. Um, has has there been a uh, was it a tough transition into organizing and becoming? I take it you're your own agent. Um, it wasn't really a tough transition. You know, I was lucky that. During the time I worked for The Source, we were the premier, you know, lifestyle magazine at the time. And, you know, I think at the peak of their uh, success, they might have been reaching 8 million, 9 million people a month or something like that. And we had very big advertisers. So for many, you know, they were just like, you know, we need this project with graffiti in it. And they're like, where do we see graffiti at? It's in The Source every month. Let's contact this guy. So it was a great uh, vehicle for exposure and, um, and it really helped me secure um, all sorts of fun work projects. Um, so, you know, and then it's like anything else, one thing loaned itself to the other. I didn't grow up in front of a computer. I learned how to use a computer while I was at the source. And they, you know, early on offered me an additional, like, increment on my paycheck if I brought in my content um, electronically, uh, you know, um, on, on a disc or on, at the time we were using SideQuest drives. And, zip disks and jazz disks and things like that. So if I brought it in on electronically already prepared, I got this additional monies added to my check. So I learned how to use a computer and learning how to use Photoshop and Illustrator and Quark at the time. But you know, Photoshop changed the way I viewed taking photos because now I shoot everything with Photoshop in mind. I can, you know, sew these photos together and I can skew and crop and clean and brighten or darken the photo however, however I need to. So it loaned itself to me, you know, shooting a little bit and shooting and learning how to do design stuff and working at a magazine loaned itself to me, being able to create, you know, print media and, you know, I've done all the pre-press for the uh, books that we, you know, for the Peace Book series. So, you know, um, it, it all kind of loaned itself to these new opportunities for myself and then just being consistent with working with big companies gave us a good footing for business. So, you know, really every experience kind of loaned itself to another experience, which loaned itself to opportunities and, uh, and being able to be a one-stop shop. Like, you know, you can come here and we can make all of these things happen. Being in print helped us, uh, gave us an edge maybe with even trying to get press and PR stuff because I knew other guys that did that type of work. So it was not too hard to get somebody to look at something I was working on and maybe report on it. So, you know, um, all of these interesting experiences have really just kind of, you know, grown and kind of come together. But, you know, they're all interconnected somehow or another. And, uh, you know, but no, I, I never thought that I would be doing all of these things and wearing so many hats on so many different projects. But, uh, you know, with each passing project, you learn something new, and, and that's an additional skill that you can hopefully bring to the table. So before the source, were you were you still, I mean, obviously with graffiti, documentation is an incredibly important thing, since it might be gone very quickly. Were you already doing a fair amount of documentation before the source? Yeah, I was taking photos. Um, you know, growing up, I remember asking my mom, she had any pictures of the friends she hung out with as a kid. And she was like, I don't have many photos, or any photos of the guys, and I was curious what she looked like at my age and what her friends look like and uh, she had a 110 she, she had a 110 camera in the closet and i used to sneak it out and i would take pictures of me and my friends and 
and we started writing graffiti. The camera conveniently fit in my back pocket, so I was able to take pictures of us riding on trains. And I documented some interesting times growing up in a lot of moments that aren't really seen. There isn't an abundance of photos out there of people painting trains. You just typically see the finished painting. So, um, you know, I had an intimate access to this community of my peers and I could shoot them while we were painting. And I managed to get the good times and a lot of the bad times on film and document my uh, contemporaries' works. And then through the source, you know, just once people realized that there was this uh, monthly showcase for art, people really dug deep and started contributing photos. And, you know, my collection grew exponentially through the source. And, you know, now granted, at this stage, 90% of the photos I have in my own are probably contributed images. But, um, you know, somewhere in that collection, or my original collection, that's dwarfed now by 20 years of contributions. But, um, you know, most of the people that have contributed to my source column are some of the very same artists that have featured in some of the projects that we've worked on. So not only did it give me an opportunity to maybe salute the artists who I grew up, um, whose work I admired, but it, it's a, a rare chance to share the stuff that you find beautiful with a much larger community of people and almost establish a, a working relationship with someone. So when I'm doing another project, I already know out of all of these guys who fits the bill for this, you know, this guy's, that's his strong suit and I'm going to call him because he does this better than anyone I know. And uh, so, you know, I've had an opportunity to give back and work with a lot of the guys. I commission people that uh, I've worked with who have contributed to my various causes and, uh, you know, and it's a good time just being able to work with the artist whose uh, work you, you admire.